is the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network. We're going to carry on and plan the sequel, because let's face it, baby, these days... You gotta have a sequel! Stop! Welcome back to Micro Queers. It's a bi-weekly queer horror short roundup, and I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and we're talking one of my favorite subgenres, killer plants. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. The coveted, very, like, there, there's just so many films. Yeah, there's like, so this, many. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking Nepenthes, everybody, and I really hope that's how you pronounce it, because that's how I'm going to choose to pronounce it. And... It's kind of a spoiler, though. I, I'm glad I didn't Google it before watching the short Joe. But um, everyone, if you well, if you haven't seen it, what's it about? <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't do the logline, so I'll make this up on my own. But uh, right. basically, it's a, about a woman named Max who is obsessed with making a match on dating services. She's just been stood up, and then just as she's kind of about to give up, she ends up matching with this really attractive lady named Venus. So they arrange a date. She shows up at this dark house, lets herself in. It's covered in plants and icky gooness. But at one point, she pulls open her phone and reminds herself that this woman that she's meeting is super hot. (laughs) So she's like, cool, press on. And it turns out that the plant is actually the woman. So this plant is impersonating a hot woman, luring her to her death. And she is eaten. (laughs) In an upstairs bedroom. She is her Venus. She is her fire. She (laughs) is her desire. (laughs) I guess so, because num num, that woman goes down easy. (laughs) Okay, I I mean, I'm jumping to the very end of this, but that we see the vines actually like keypad on the phone. Clickety clacking. Yeah. (laughs) Very cute. But the whole time I was like, hey, like, you know, when we talk about things like this, it's like, well, she's making a really lot of dumb decisions. Like, I, I don't know about you, but like when... In the past, when I've done, um, you know, app hookups, it's never like <laughs> I don't do the oh, just come inside. The door is open. No, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah, this was red flag central. I love the fact like that's why I specifically made mention that she pulls up the phone and it's even a different picture. It's like a sexy like. Yeah, with like the boobs cover, but the back arched. <laughs> because i was like oh okay this fucking plant is smart because it's like this house is creepy as fuck it's not like yeah regular people would just be walking out the door but this woman is thirsty she wants to get laid by this hot lady so she presses on and it ultimately means she does yeah i what i appreciated about is the fact that the fact that this is a queer woman is just that like there's no point Mm -hmm. like there's not really a queer angle to this she just like this could be about a non-queer person who just isn't which is which is nice the difference is though that watching it i kept thinking like i feel like she should be more cautious <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> be- because she's a queer person, but or, or actually even a woman, just a woman in general. Period. Oh yeah, yeah. It's um, it's interesting. So I found an interview on Morbidly Beautiful with the director Ariel Hansen, and mm-hmm. she explains that one of the reasons she wanted to make this short because she's made a bunch of other ones, but I think this is the one that's either the most queer or the only queer one. But she says she really wanted yeah. to work in body horror. So she says body horror in particular is fun to explore as a woman our bodies have been picked apart mystified and objectified for so many years it's quite cathartic to show a female body opened up or turned inside out as if it's not her own which i think many women have already been made to feel so the the queer aspect it i think it's just you know yeah we're telling a story of a woman meeting a woman like it's so not a big deal like the interesting thing here is apparently the woman it's nonchalant it is it's nonchalant yeah and i i like that i think this is the kind of queer representation that we're often hungry for it's like this character just happens to be a lesbian and bad shit is happening to her it is and so then watching it though i put in some of my own stuff because i'm sorry it's some of my own experiences because this is a five minute short it's not very long we don't get a lot of information besides like just base information and so i'm just like okay she walks in, there's goo immediately there. 
Mm-hmm. Her the the stairwell is immediately covered in goo. She's touching goo everywhere. So yeah, she pulls the phone out, but I'm just kind of like, okay, in my mind, this character Max, she is in a small town with slim pickings <laughs> of yeah. other women to be with. So <laughs> that's the only way I can be like, you know, oh, like this is the only reason why she would put up with this because I can promise you, no matter how horny I am, I walk into a house full of goo, I'm either like that's gross or this is unsafe and leaving. <laughs> or you've walked into the set dressing of Cherry Falls and they've gotten the party started without you. <laughs> yes, what a deep cut. <laughs> but no, but I mean it, it did remind me of um the a short we, one of the first shorts we ever covered for Micro Queers which was Hey You. Both end similarly, but this one is more, you know, supernatural, whereas Hey You is very much grounded in a real, like, cultural situation. Yeah, and and I think the point that you raise, which is that we actually get to see the Vine sort of setting up the potential next Tinder <laughs> match date, it ends what could be a really upsetting and and very just icky short in a moment of kind of camp and humor, which I appreciated. So it's a horrifying situation, but the ending of it mm-hmm. is like, oh, this fucking vine is hungry. It's on the hunt for matches. Well, the, t- the a touch that I really liked was when Max walks into the room, um, not only are there like bones on the floor and human skulls on the floor, but there's also like get out written in blood from someone who like wrote it while they were dying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the the set design of this because it's actually quite simple. But even when you walk in, you can see that there's a, a ton of this vine just in the upper right hand corner or left hand corner of the frame. Yeah. So like she walks in and it's like this vine is everywhere in this house. Like I'm not sure even if she had wanted to leave if she would have been able to. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's okay. So let's pretend like then we're going into our feature film territory here because we actually have covered a film on our main feed that is very much like this short or I guess Mm -hmm. vice versa because it's game after. But (laughs) what film is that, Joe? (laughs) Yes. uh, So that would, of course, be Carter Smith's The Ruins based on uh, Scott Smith's book of the same name. And it's it's kind of fun, right? Because this gives us a little taste of what that plant would look like if it was actually not in the Mexico, uh, like isolated in Mexico. It's like, what if this was in like a fucking house next to you? Which I love, right? It's like, it's in the house. Like it's like, I imagine like, you know, the climax of this hypothetical feature film is like, I don't know, people like go in the basement. It's just like this hub of like this breathing, pulsating plant bulb. That's just like got like humans all inside it. Oh, it's Mm -hmm. so good. So I, Uh, You know, we joked about it at the top of this recording, but yeah, there aren't a lot of killer plant things like TV shows or films or whatever, because the idea in and of itself is inherently silly. Yeah, you end up with like Little Shop of Horrors, right? Where it's like, it's camp, it's musical, it's, you know, this giant plant climbing the Empire State Building. Yeah, I mean, like, and that's as we talked about in the ruins, that's a criticism that was lobbied against that film is like, Oh, it can't be scary because it's plants. Like the, the, the sheer idea of this and and granted the ruins takes itself very seriously. Whereas this, like you said, I like that it is serious. It is upsetting. Like as soon as we see the incredible makeup effects of this film, it is horrifying, but then there's just that button, that button at the end. So Mm -hmm. I think it would be cool to see a feature length version of this, that balanced that horror. And I don't even want to say, comedy but like maybe darkly yeah Yeah. (laughs) just just like like a dark sprinkle it in a little bit right yeah exactly (laughs) yeah so i would definitely want to see like i love the idea of the ruins in the city and in the suburbs (laughs) in the suburbs yeah So I love this idea. I would definitely watch a feature length version of this. And I think you could do it in the vein of like arachnophobia where, uh, you know, you like who's paying the bills on this house. So like, I'm imagining Mm -hmm. that, you know, it needs water to survive, but like the water gets turned off because it hasn't been paying the bills. So then like people come to like check on the meter or something. And it's just like (laughs) eating people as they come into the house. So is it from the POV of the plant then is the plant our pro anti hero of sorts <laughs> yeah it's no it I, well here's the thing too so will we keep it queer like will we keep a protagonist of the film queer 
Yeah, I I think it'd be fun to see like just random people getting murdered in this house, but it's all building up to like queer women or like queer people are disappearing around the city. And it's like the plant is picking on queer people because we are more vulnerable and less likely to be noticed if we go missing. See, I was going the opposite direction. I was thinking, okay. cool, a queer person moves into this house, befriends the plant, but it's in the Bible Belt. And so they start picking off all like the really religious people that persecute them. <laughs> Okay, I would also watch that version, 100%. Yes, so... <laughs> Two <laughs> very we... different films, though. Like, the tones would be totally different. <laughs> right, and now we need listeners to tell us which of these two films would you rather watch? <laughs> the arachnophobia, darkly comedic one, or the reverse... Revenge-ish. Yeah, like the queer revenge <laughs> film in the Bible Belt. I love it. Or both. <laughs> or both. No, no, make them pick. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I'm down for either one of these. But yeah, so everyone, let us know what you think. And until our next micro queers, we can cross out Nepenthes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm gonna get this. Did right. I say it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and cross out micro queers. <laughs> Disgusting Podcast Network, home of creepy, or disturbing, and terrifying creepy pastas, SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, Kapora queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. Horror centric interviews. Listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares, like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.